Today we want to talk about colonial evolution, the evolution of uh, economics, government, religion, and society. Even though the majority of immigrants who uh, came to America were English, America never became the intended replica of England. Instead, a distinctive hybrid culture emerged out of English, African, Indian, and later German and Scots-Irish influences. I want to talk first uh, briefly about colonial economy. Uh, we've already talked about it on the previous slide, so it'll just be um, a review. The European system of trade was based on the economic theory of mercantilism. It was a philosophy of nation building. There was hostile competition for world trade between the empires of Europe, uh, the Dutch Empire, the English Empire, the French Empire, the Russian Empire, all competed to dominate world trade. The idea of mercantilism was to make the mother country self-sufficient by having colonies that could provide the raw materials that the mother country itself uh, no longer had or had never had. And of course, uh, what they sought for was a balance of trade. You want to have more exports, fewer imports. The southern colonies, um, their trade, their economy was based on agriculture because, um, as those who settled there found, there were perfect natural conditions that uh, permitted uh, agriculture to become an economic boon. That is, uh, plenty of water with rivers, streams, um, semi-tropical climate, which allowed for long growing seasons and short, mild winters, um, and perfect soil, good soil. And it was the aristocratic class from England that dominated the population in the South, uh, those who were accustomed to being the landowners in England. And of course, um, although those aristocratic sons in the South uh, first tried Indian labor, then they used uh, indentured servants, eventually settled on slavery as a means of a, a labor supply. So society in the South was an aristocratic society that was upheld by slave labor. The northern colonies commerce was based on, uh, or I'm sorry, the northern colonies economy was based on commerce, that is trade. And they took advantage of the natural and human ad advantages that were available, that is good ports for trade. Um, the people who settled there were families from the middle class of England who were living by uh, Puritan doctrines, one of the most important of which was the doctrine of the calling. The um, doctrine of the calling, as John Calvin taught it, was that every individual had two callings, the general calling and an individual calling. The general calling was that every human being was called to serve God. The individual calling was a man's occupation or a person's occupation. Uh, John Calvin believed in predestination, the idea that uh, human beings, before they were even born, that they were destined for a certain occupation. So the occupation that Puritans worked in they worked at religiously because it was part of their service to God. 
Um, they, rather than uh, working to survive or working to live, they lived to work. And that idea of what would become the American work ethic would last throughout the centuries until in, at least until the 1950s, uh, when in the 1960s it began to disappear. And now, of course, very few people are motivated by what used to be called the American work ethic. As well as the American work ethic, Puritans helped to establish what would be known as the American character. Uh, people around the world would come to uh, describe Americans by these uh, characteristics. The characteristics of self-reliance, of industry or being always busy, active in useful pursuits, frugality, making what they had last, uh, avoiding extravagance. Also, it's the Puritans who helped to place an emphasis on education um, more than uh, anywhere else in Europe. Education is central to the Puritan uh, character and what becomes the American character, focus on education, which we'll talk more about uh, a bit later. Also, the ideas and the practice of a type of democracy, which can be found in Puritan towns, cities, where every male landowner uh, above the age of about 17 could participate in local government, uh, even to the point of um, suggesting legislation, holding office, the idea of the town meeting. There's also uh, evolution in the political institutions in the colonies. What develops, and this was not a conscious attempt to be different from England, uh, but rather it is following the pattern of British government only with a much different experience. What develops in the colonies is representative government. While the company or the king uh, sent governors from England that uh, seemed to have a great deal of power, as it actually evolves in America, the governors will have very limited power. And in fact, where most of the power resides in colonial government is in the colonial assembly. The first one was established in Jamestown in 1619, which the colonial assembly in Virginia would be called the House of Burgesses. The members that sat in the colonial assembly would be elected in Virginia by counties. So each county would choose anywhere uh, from two to seven representatives and they would represent the county from which they had been elected. So what develops in colonial government that is different than England is what we call direct representation. Direct representation, that is, that men voted in by people, let's say, in Henrico County, Virginia. Those representatives represent the interests of people living in Henrico County. What existed in England is something called virtual representation. That is, it was the idea that every member of parliament, both in the House of Lords and in the House of Commons, represented virtually every English subject anywhere in the world. So, virtual representation. But that's not what evolved in America. Instead, it was direct representation. One of the reasons that the Colonial Assembly uh, was able to maintain political power was because they had uh, power of the purse. 
which means, of course, that they controlled the money. It was the colonial assembly that imposed taxes on themselves, on the people living in the colonies. They collected the taxes and they spent the taxes, which included paying the salary of the governor. So if the governor wanted his pay, he's not going to exercise veto power or other means uh, controlling the colonial assembly because if the governor angered those members of the colonial assembly, they could withhold his wages. So as time passed, um, the colonial assembly garnered and exercised more power than the colonial uh, governor. Documents that were very important in colonial government in all of the colonies, not just Virginia, but all the colonies would develop a similar system of government with direct representation and the colonial assemblies having the power of the purse. But the documents that were revered or that were significant in colonial government were those documents that were also uh, essential to British government. And of course, that begins with uh, the Magna Carta. 1215, King John had gained the position of, of king, but the barons, the landowners, had come to King John and they said, if you want us to be loyal to you, if, if you want to maintain your position as king, you've got to sign this document guaranteeing that you will protect our rights, our liberties. So these barons wrote up a document that would be called the Magna Carta and King Jane, King John was forced to sign it. That was 1215. Throughout time, uh, there were other situations where Parliament would write another document, giving it to a king, and the king would sign that, guaranteeing to protect or to abide by the, the rights of English landowners. For instance, in 1628, after the English Civil War and demise of the monarchy, when King Charles I uh, had his head cut off, after this, the monarchy was finally restored after 11 or 12 years of what was called the Commonwealth, where Parliament ruled without a king. But in 1628, the monarchy was restored, and Parliament insisted that the king sign a petition of rights. Once again, listing the rights of Englishmen and the king's uh, guarantee that he would protect those rights. Then a few years later, uh, 1689, when uh, King James II abdicated uh, the throne of England, knowing that Parliament had invited uh, King William of Orange in the Netherlands uh, to come take the throne of England because King James II had married a Catholic and his wife was pregnant, and Parliament was afraid that if she had a son, that that would mean that down the line, England would once again be ruled by a Catholic monarch, which they did not want. So they invited uh, William and his wife Mary, who happened to be the sister of James II, to come forcibly take the, king, take the throne of England. But James II, seeing the handwriting on the wall, uh, abdicated and fled to Europe. So William and Mary became king and queen of England, and they had to sign what was called the Bill of Rights, 1689. Once again, uh, protecting the rights of Englishmen. So the colonists kept these documents as very significant 
to their form of government. And they follow the examples of Parliament in every time there is a conflict between the colonists and the king, they will insist on a petition of rights or a bill of rights, as we'll find out later. On this slide, you can see images of those three important uh, bills that Parliament had passed, as well as the image of King John signing the Magna Carta at Runnymede, June 15, 1215. So, as the colonies evolved, the power of the crown in America was diminishing. And on the eve of the revolution, the governing elites in all the colonies were American-born, and they had been educated and influenced by classical theories of government. This is important in understanding how the government we have today evolved. So the classical theory of government was as follows, and I have the um, description on the slide. Classical theory of government said that government or the state should guarantee the freedom of each man. Justice and rights are the bonds between men and their government. They believed in a commitment to ethical cultivation and the common good, rooted in justice, the idea that people prevented government power from getting out of control, and that citizens were virtuous enough to sacrifice their individual desires for the common good. Also what becomes evident in the evolving of the colonies is that social distinctions were much less than they were anywhere else in Europe. Uh, in fact, I have on this slide some comments made by European visitors. One comment in 1747 said, the inhabitants of the colonies are generally educated in Republican principles. Upon Republican principles, all is conducted. And again, I point you to that definition above of what they meant by Republican. So I would not want you to confuse that with today's political parties. They're not talking about a political party, but a theory of government. Also, another uh, visitor in 1748 uh, remarked on uh, the lack of social distinctions. He said, leveling principles prevail. Adam Smith in the 1770s, uh, a man noted for writing the book Wealth of Nations. Uh, he was a member of parliament in Britain, and he made this comment about the colonies. Americans enjoy more equality than among the inhabitants of the mother country, and their manners and their governments have hitherto been more Republican too. Now I want to move on to talking about the evolution of society in the colonies, a little more uh, what we could call mundane information, except that uh, my uh, intention in these next few slides is to try to uh, give you a picture in your mind of what life was like in the colonies during this time period. So first of all, uh, the lifespan of people living in the colonies in America uh, was 15 to 25 years longer than their counterparts in England. Reasons for that are varied, but we could point to two things in particular. For one thing, it was not as crowded. You didn't have the large, uh, overpopulated cities. There was more or, I'm sorry, there was less available land in England. Um, so people living closer together uh, made the spread of disease uh, much more um, possible and uh, lack of jobs, uh, high rate of crime, all of those things were present 
in England that would not be as prevalent in America. Also, people in the colonies had a better diet, uh, more fresh air, uh, more vegetables, so their longer lifespan, lifespan included those two reasons. As far as the homes they lived in, in New England, the towns would, first of all, uh, spring up uh, with the rude wooden buildings, wattle and daub structures, to becoming more substantial buildings made out of stone or brick. In New England, uh, every town was built uh, basically on the same pattern. That is where you have, in the center of the town, you have the church which also functions as the courthouse. And then um, streets around the courthouse making a square. And from the courthouse, streets uh, continue on in the form of squares all the way out to the outskirts of town. Any gardens or plots to grow a few vegetables, a few crops would be outside of town. So you might live uh, across the street from the courthouse, but you would walk to the edge of town to work in your garden. In every town, there were three essential buildings, the church, the tavern, and a blockhouse. A town uh, could be fined if they didn't have each of those buildings. In the, we'll talk more about those three buildings in a few minutes. That's New England. In the South, where the population was much more uh, scattered, uh, sparsely populated, they went from walled towns to large plantations and small villages. The South would never have any large cities until closer to the time of the Revolution, and then it was really only one of what would be called a city in the South. The average size of houses, whether in the North or in the South, started at about 16 feet long and about 14 feet wide. There would be windows, but there would be no glass, no wooden shutters, or oiled paper. So in the beginning, uh, when there's so windows or openings were very essential but the, the only covering that they would use for windows in time of uh, inclement weather uh, might be blankets or rugs that they would put up over the window. But the reason, one of the reasons that windows were so important and something that uh, few people think about, but the rhythm of the days of people living in the colonies were regulated by the available light. So people worked from the time it was light enough to work until the sun started going down and it was too, too dark to work. There would be some occupation that the work day would be rather short because the work itself required uh, a great deal of light. So even the early morning wouldn't be enough light, and later in the evening, again, the light would not be sufficient. They had uh, lamps, of course, candles, but um, they, they didn't illuminate inside a building uh, to any great extent. So most work, most um, activities, were regulated by sunlight. So on cloudy days, overcast days, it would diminish the amount of work that it was possible to accomplish. On this slide, I have some images of houses. Uh, those three across the top are buildings from New England. The one on the far left is a photograph taken from Plymouth. Living History Museum that is there in Plymouth. The middle picture is a house where John Adams was born. That's in Quincy, Massachusetts, just outside of Boston. And then the 
uh, picture on the right at the top is Peace Fields. That was the name of the home of John and, Qu uh, John and Abigail Adams when John Adams died. The middle picture on the far left is a blockhouse. The blockhouse was where the people in the, in the town or the village would go in case of an Indian raid. So the bottom part of the blockhouse was narrower than the top part because the people would go into the ground level and climb up ladders to get up in the top part where then they would pull the ladder up and close a trap door uh, to prevent Indians from being able to enter and give the, the colonists a level of protection. If you notice, there are slits, openings in the top part. Those were to put their guns through to fire on the uh, attacking Indians. So every town had to have a blockhouse. Then the middle and the uh, middle photo on the right are of churches. The, the white building is typical of churches in New England, and the one on the far right in the middle uh, was in Jamestown. The bottom three images are from the south. You start out with uh, Fort James, Jamestown, and uh, the middle is, uh, you see the, the three ships and men uh, going back and forth from the ships, and on the right, uh, a plantation home. So these buildings on this slide show the evolution of dwellings in the colonies. Food. Um, interesting facts about food in the colonies. Uh, the colonists were at first very leery of trying new things things that they were not accustomed to. For instance, lobsters and crabs were looked nothing like those that they were accustomed to uh, on the shores of European countries. So they were hesitant to, to choose them as a source of food. Other, other food items as well, they were very reluctant to try for a long time. Very little wheat, or rye was being grown, even though um, English who um, immigrated to the colonies found Indians who, were, who had fields that they planted, crops that they grew, yet most of those crops, well, were types of corn, a lot of other widely varied crops as well, but there, there was no wheat or rye, to start with, uh, things that normally Europeans would use to bake breads. Um, so for breads, they used corn. Breads were cooked in skillets over the fire in the fireplace. One of the items in New England was that was very common sustenance was peas porridge. The photograph, the top photograph on the right is an image of peas porridge. I don't know about you, but it doesn't look very appetizing to me. What it was, was a mixture of beans and peas all mixed and cooked together into a kind of mush. But what evolved out of that would be a very English dish, very New England dish, uh, New England baked beans, where they would uh, change, revise, and improve on the recipe uh, until they came up with uh, baked beans. For meat, uh, there was very little meat eaten. Uh, they very seldom ate their cows or their chickens. They kept the cows in order to get dairy products, butter, cream, uh, cheese, chickens, of course, they keep for their eggs. Meat that they did eat would be, meat, would be eaten in the winter. And Something I found really interesting, uh, again, along the line of difference between the North and the South, that any meats cooked in the North 
would be boiled. In the South, meats would either be fried or roasted. Um, and as I said, you usually only eaten in the winter because they had no way of preserving meats for any length of time. So they're not going to go out and kill a deer uh, in the summer or the spring uh, for a family because they the meat would spoil before they could eat all of the meat. But whatever they ate, it was usually washed down with beer because they were accustomed to water in Europe being polluted. They didn't realize that the water in America was almost pristine, did not have all the pollution that overcrowded cities and the beginning of industry um, caused polluted water. So to begin with, everyone drank beer. That's including uh, even children and babies. But the beer that they drank uh, was very much watered down. So the process of heating, boiling uh, the water to make beer purified it enough that they, it was an acceptable drink. By the early to mid-1700s, foods became more varied and more plentiful. And on this slide, there are a few images of tables set as they would have been in colonial days with the array of food that would have been available. Then on the next two slides, I have some images of colonial homes, families, and information about meals, uh, colonial breakfast, colonial dinner, supper, types of food that you would eat if you were wealthy or if you were poor. There were several occupations that were available for colonists to be able to make a living, other than being merchants in the north or planters in the south. So for men, uh, they might be a barber, which also would be the town surgeon. The barber, of course, being familiar with knives and using knives. Uh, so if you had an injury, you would go to the barber in the same building, in the same room where he cut hair, shave the men, that he might amputate your leg or your foot. So the barber would also serve as a surgeon. Uh, you might be a brewer. Those are the men who brewed the beer. Uh, Cooper, who was a barrel maker. The barrels were um, very crucial to most colonists. Uh, not only in businesses, but also uh, in individual homes. They used barrels uh, for a lot of different reasons. Uh, you might be a courier, that is someone who was skilled in leather work, or a draper, a man who dealed in uh, selling cloth from England, a greensmith, that's a man who worked with copper, Paul Revere, in fact, was a greensmith. Carpenters were called house rights, and of course there was plenty of work for carpenters. Uh, ironmongers, that is, a man who traded in iron. Uh, miller, the man who could grind your corn, uh, later on your wheat or your rye, into flour. Uh, the roper, as you might assume, that's the men who made ropes. And again, ropes were a crucial element for colonial life. Tailors, tinners, that's men who worked in the tin mines. And a stationer, that is someone who was a seller of books and writing items, which again, very essential for the colonial lifestyle. As we're going to find out later on, Books were very important to people living in the colonies, as well as writing materials. Women could assist in the family economy in several different ways. Women did not work out in the public, except for two occupations. But they could help 
by doing things in their own home. The two occupations that took them out into public, one was the midwife, and the midwife, a very important person in a, a village, a town, uh, because she would be the one not only that would help with childbirth, but also any illness, any sickness, you call for the midwife. Uh, very few towns until in the mid-1700s, very few uh, physicians available, except in the large cities in the north. So it would be the midwife that if your children came down with chicken pox or measles or uh, a flu, you call for the midwife who would be knowledgeable in using herbs and other types of home remedies. So she would help also with minor wounds and things. So very crucial uh, person in the community. And the other way that a woman could work in public was to be what was called an ale wife. That is the wife of a tavern keeper. She could assist her husband in working in the taverns, uh, preparing meals, serving meals, uh, as well as serving the drinks. But women at home could help by spinning, weaving, making baskets, uh, doing different types of needle crafts. She, might, she would do it for herself, but also other women who perhaps were not as skilled in those areas uh, the woman could spin thread for another woman and barter. Let's say a woman was really great at making baskets, and she would barter her baskets to a woman for thread that she had spun on her spinning wheel. Also, women could help by growing uh, kitchen gardens, vegetables, herbs, things that uh, not everyone was had the green thumb to be able to produce, so she could grow enough for herself, as well as um, extra to barter for other things that the household needed. Transportation in the colonies was very simple. The interesting thing to me is that transportation, the means of transportation, changed very little from the beginning of human history um, until in the 1800s. So through colonial days, um, horseback, uh, walking, of course. Uh, later, they'll, they'll have horses uh, pulling stagecoaches. So very, very common, uh, as it had been for centuries before. Roads, uh, very few roads. Uh, they were execrable to non-existent. Usually, the use of Indian trails or animal trails dominated as roadways. And of course, the more often they were used, the wider they became. Uh, but as far as the route, they would follow these uh, age-old Indian trails or animal trails. There would be no bridges. For instance, a trip from Boston to New York City would take about six days. Nowadays, of course, you could make it in, what, a couple of hours. But six days of traveling from daylight till dark. Uh, by 1766, there would be regular stage, li stage lines between New York City and Philadelphia. And then, with these regular stage lines, you could make the trip in three days, but at great discomfort because the stages had no shocks, uh, no springs to start with, uh, wooden or iron wheels. You would start your journey at 3 a.m. in the morning and you would travel all day long until maybe 9 p.m. at night with a few short stops to change horses to maybe get a few refreshments at, a, at an inn or a tavern, but very uncomfortable. In the rainy weather, you might have to get out. Passengers would have to get out of the stage and help. Uh, men would help push the stage out of 
mud uh, in the winter uh, when it was icy. Stage coaches was very common for them to slide off the road, get stuck in a ditch full of snow. Passengers again would have to get out and the men would have to help get the stage out of the ditch. So travel was not comfortable. It was not convenient. The great highways, once again, the same as they had been from the beginning of time, were waterways, rivers, uh, streams, lakes, where you could travel by canoe, by boat, by barge. That was probably the most comfortable way to travel, unless you were in a raging river, a flooded river. So transportation changed very little during colonial days from what it had been centuries before. That's it for today. I hope you will tune back in next time when we uh, come back with a new video. We're going to be talking about the significance of taverns in colonial days. Also, you might check uh, iTunes and uh, Spotify. We have some podcasts that uh, we have available also under the name History Bites. Thank you. See you next time.